Hello, everybody. Thank you for choosing to spend your Saturday night with us. Um, my name is Kate, and I work here at the People's Forum. Um, if you haven't been here before, we are a political education center, a community center, an art space, a movie theater. Um, if you look on our walls, we have revolutionary posters from Cuba, revolutionary paintings with uh, women from the African continent pouring coffee on Napoleon's head. As you can see, we take um, culture very seriously here, because um, it's an essential part of revolutionary movements. We know that art moves people who move history, and so it's important to be able to nourish people's spirits, to keep them, what am I looking for? To keep them inspired and engaged, but also take serious the gravity of the moments that we're in. And as we're witnessing what's going on in Gaza, we know that it's important to maintain and sustain our movements, and that also means nourishing our spirits, using art to educate each other, and you know, just being there for each other and being able to support. Um, and so in that vein, we're very excited to be having this event on Writers for Palestine. I know it's a, a fundraiser also for Palestine Legal, and actually we have a room upstairs named after Michael Ratner, who's one of the founders of Palestine Legal. So if you haven't been here before, we hope you explore this space, we hope you enjoy it, and we hope you come back again. Um, we're also part of the Artists Against Apartheid Network, so if you haven't heard about that, we encourage you to plug in. I think it's artists... no against apartheid.art, um, and you can check out more about uh, the resources, and we do poster drops, other um, events that have been happening. But that's just from me and the People's Forum, and I just want to, again, extend a warm, warm welcome to you here. Welcome home. Welcome to the People's Forum. And I'll pass it over to Sovi. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you so much to the People's Forum for having us. Um, good evening. Welcome. I'm Sophie Heron. I'm one of the organizers for this evening, along with Sophus Hell, uh, Miller Wolf Orberman, and uh, Ricky Maldonado, who can't be here tonight and sends his deepest regards. Um, it is an honor to be here with you and with these wonderful writers um, raising money for Palestine Legal. Um, this past October, I and my colleagues resigned our positions at the Poetry Center of the 92nd Street Y after um, leadership canceled Viet Thanh Nguyen's reading in response to his signature of an open letter calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, in the whirlwind of the following weeks, Palestine Legal's immediate compassionate help navigating my new legal and employment realities was a rock in a storm. I truly cannot overstate how much Palestine Legal's very existence is a balm, not to mention how incredible their staff is. Um, one thing I have never felt in, um, after my resignation is alone, and I am thrilled to have Radhika Sainath from Palestine Legal here with us tonight. She will speak briefly before the readings. A couple of other housekeeping remarks. Parul Segal is not able to make it due to personal reasons. She also sends her regrets and her love. Um, also, we'll remind you throughout, but please notice the large link and the QR code um, available in the venue. Um, please donate <laughs> to Palestine Legal, whether that's $5 or $18 or $500 or a thousand dollars, or more. <laughs> Whatever is meaningful to you, thank you. Palestine Legal um, also has a commitment to mutual aid that I would like to lift up and to emulate. Um, providing relief from retribution is essential. So are the lives and the future of Palestine and Palestinians. Um, Mecca, the Middle East Children's Alliance, provides emergency humanitarian aid as well as funding for future rebuilding. You, may, you can donate to them at mecaforpeace.org. That's mecaforpeace.org. Mecca is M-E-C-A. Um, <clears throat> the Middle East Children's Alliance. So thank you again for being here. Um, as I said earlier, it is an honor. It's also a grief and it is a rage. Um, it is ongoing mourning for the past four months, for the past 75 years, for the past... 
It is a grief that, like all griefs, leaves us running into corners in the dark. What each of us bruises ourselves on day to day may differ. The headlines, seeing a child wake up, walking past a hospital, fruit in the grocery store, the death of a loved one, our work, our friendships, our history, the headlines. <laughs> because the prism of grief touches so much, we left open to tonight's writers what they might choose to read in the hope that this accumulation of perspectives approaches something like the experience of ongoing mourning in a time when taking action for Palestinian safety and liberation can lead to personal and professional retribution. I hope that something in tonight's readings resonates with you in the messy, unexpected ways we touch each other in times of crisis and hopefully provide strength for our work now and to come. Finally, introducing Radhika Sainath. She is a senior staff attorney at Palestine Legal where she oversees this organization's casework. Radhika has advised hundreds of students, professors, activists, artists, and writers on issues relating to free speech, anti-Palestinian discrimination, and academic freedom. Together with the ACLU, Radhika recently sued Florida Governor Ron DeSantis over his attempt to deactivate Students for Justice in Palestine in Florida. Prior to joining Palestine Legal, Radhika lived in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, where she worked with the International Solidarity Movement. She's a former union organizer and a frequent commentator on media outlets including MSNBC, Democracy Now!, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, Jezebel, Politico, The Village Voice, and more. Her writing has appeared in The Nation, Jacobin, Boston Review, Literary Hub, and more, and her novel is forthcoming. Thank you all again. Don't forget to donate, and welcome Radhika. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all tonight for coming out and giving so generously of your time and hopefully your dollars as well. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Palestine Legal, we are legal defense for the movement for Palestinian rights in the United States. We are here to have the back of activists and um, our services are free. Since October 7th, we have been working around the clock. Um, it's been nonstop, our phones have been ringing. It's just been like a tsunami of requests for legal help. Um, no industry has been untouched. We have been helping, of course, writers and artists, but also students, professors, um, elementary school teachers, high school teachers, grassroots activists, doctors, um, lawyers, um, children as well in elementary school, um, regular people who are just working class people, for example, um, target workers, Santas, we advised a professional poker playing grandma. I mean, you name it, and people have come to us to report um, f being fired, being censored, being punished, or being falsely accused of supporting terrorism or being anti-Semites, again, for taking a principled stance for Palestinian rights, for speaking out against genocide, for speaking out for a ceasefire. So um, it's just been incredibly overwhelming. And so uh, we do defend, we do depend, you know, we're a small office. Um, we have 13 people and five attorneys and we represent people all across the country. So we depend on small donors like you all. So we really appreciate anything that you can give. And, um, you know, I'll just wrap up by saying that you know, there have been a lot of reports lately and you have, I'm sure, you know, been reading the news about what's happening both in Gaza and of course here, but what you hear in the media as far as the censorship campaigns are really just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much happening um, under the surface. So, um, you know, if, uh, if you all are faced with any attacks or censorship or need legal help, we are here to help you and just feel free to contact us. The best way is through our website. There's a link that says get help and we review our intakes uh, multiple times a day, five days a week. So don't hesitate to come to us if you need help. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you.
They really are quite fast. Um, so we're going to go into the readings. We'll start with Sinan. After Hafisa, we will take a 15-minute break, and then we will come back for the second half. Sinan, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you to the organizers. I'm really honored to be here, and I want to echo what was said. Uh, Palestine Legal are real heroes in a time of cowardice, so I urge you all to, to donate whatever you can. I'm very honored to be here at this moment and to share with you a few poems about uh, Gaza. I'm, um, the first one is called From the Book of Genocide. It will be the only one that uh, requires a preface. In the beginning of the, of the genocide, many Israeli officials were saying uh, that the Palestinians could just go to the Sinai. And it reminded me of, the, of that other Palestinian called Jesus, who also upon his birth was told by the, or his father was told by the angel to, to go to Egypt to flee. So the book of genocide, behold Gaza, angels of death appear in skies and on screens, leaflets dropping down like dead birds, arise and flee into Egypt and stay there forever. Herod will seek every Palestinian child and destroy them. Second poem is called A Hand. He was going to draw a sea or two where the trails of tears could sleep. He was going to draw a sky where the eyes of the dead could go on living in distant stars. He was going to draw a hand drawing, but he will not draw. He will extend his hand and wait for someone to find his corpse in the rubble. Humanitarian pause. The Israeli Minister of Genocidal Affairs assured his American counterparts that once the operation is completed, the people of Gaza will have safe passage to return to their homes as ghosts. They will be allowed to live in the ruins. And the last one is a, a bit longer called After Words. Words as in W-O-R-D-S. My father's warm, warm palms shielded my ears. I could hear his blood racing in his veins, as if being chased by the bombs falling outside. My mother's lips fluttered like a terrified butterfly. She was talking to God and asking him to protect us. That's what she did during the last war. And he listened. Her arms were clasped around my two sisters. Maybe God could not hear her this time. The bombing was so loud. After our house in Jabalia was destroyed, we hid in the Anurwa school. But the bombs followed us there too and found us. Mother and father lied. We didn't stay together. I walked alone for hours. They lied. There are no angels, just people walking many of them children. The teacher lied too. My wounds did not become anemones, like that poem we learned in school says. Sidu didn't lie. Sidu means grandfather. Sidu didn't lie. He was there just as he promised me before he died. I found him leaning on his cane, thinking of Yafa, when he saw me, he spread his arms wide like an eagle, a tired eagle with a cane. We hugged, and he kissed my eyes. Are we going back to Yafa, Sidu? We can't. Why? We are dead. So are we in heaven, Sidu? We are in Palestine, Habibi. And Palestine is heaven and hell. And what will we do now? We will wait. Wait for what? For the others to return. Thank you.
Hi everyone, I'm Farah Barqawi. Um, I'm a writer, poet, and um, feminist organizer uh, from Palestine. I wrote this today, so excuse any editorial issues. Um, a few hours in the sun, on the roof among laundry lines of one's own. It is 8 a.m. in the morning of day 120 of the Israeli genocidal aggression on Gaza. I could not sleep until it was 4 a.m. last night, but the insisting ringing and weird sharp flashing of the phone just woke me up, carrying my mother's voice. For many years, my phone has been usually on silent mode, except for a few important numbers who are allowed to by bypass the barrier. My mother, my father, my flatmate, and a couple of close friends. Just in case of, God forbid, an emergency. But since I missed over a dozen calls at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., 5 a.m., up till 7 a.m. on January 3rd from a new number acquired by my mother who disappeared in an evil connection blackout for over 10 days in Gaza City. And after I spent the whole day lashing myself in curses and tears as I kept calling her back in vain and replaying the eight second long voicemail she had left me at 7.08 a.m. when she lost hope in me picking up the call. Please wake up. For the love of God, wake up begging me as if I'd hear her. A friend of mine helped me to set up the flashing light option when the phone is on silent to make sure I don't miss a call ever again, be it during sleep or awakeness or the in-between. Finally, I caught you, finally. My mother's voice was very lively as she heard me answering with a sleep-filled allo. I woke, I woke you up, didn't, didn't I? Wallah, I'm sorry, ya mama, ya habibti. But I have been trying to catch the signal for two hours now, and I stayed all this long on the roof with no intention of going back down before I succeed. And I did. You cannot imagine how happy I am. I assured her that she would never worry. She should never worry my, about my sleep at all when trying to reach out, thinking to myself that, first, it is my fault that I am in Brooklyn, seven hours time difference away from her, and second, how my mother, the strong, badass, thick-voiced, fast-paced, super in control, and sometimes many times intimidating person, was, it was, is, and will always be a mother when it comes to me, my mother, in her desperate attempts to reach me, my mother, in her guilt about waking me up. Forgive me, mama, but you know, at least, at least we can hear each other's voices, even if for a couple of seconds, she said in a warm and quieter tone this time. I asked, I asked her about the situation. She said they are fine. Everything is well, as, the new meaning, as in the new meaning of well. Not starving, not without water, not without any connection, and with relatively less intensive bombing. She mentioned that my cousin's sons have grown a lot in the past months and became very reliable. They go out daily on their own to look for drinking water and food ingredients. That today they went on foot all the way to Beit Lahia since the Israeli military tanks withdrew to fetch some rice, but unfortunately couldn't find any and walked all the way back with empty hands. But you know, they have really matured. Mashallah, they're not kids anymore. She turned the questions to me, how I am, if I have anything new to tell her, any new happenings, and I answered her that nothing really happened, which is both the truth and a lie. It's the daily proven truth of this ugly world. We are on day 120 of the Israeli genocidal aggression on Gaza. Nothing much outside of the huge and dark prison where she and her sisters and their kids and their kids of kids and colleagues and friends and other people who are still alive there awaiting death any moment has changed. I am still in New York City, surrounded by the same supportive friends, having a room that is still mine, that I leave temporarily but always manage to find when I want to go back home, and enduring the same ugliness of a system and many, many people that think that my people 
do not deserve to have homes, eat, drink, live, grow old, or even being born. It is both the truth and a lie because what I, what I would have liked to tell her doesn't suit the critical non-ending moment she has been living, nor the rarity of the connection. That for instance, on the first day of teaching this spring semester, I went out of the classroom filled with 18-year-olds who probably do not know where Palestine is and compulsively entered a piercing shop and asked for a septum piercing, a thing that I didn't think about before and will surely make her unhappy as all the other piercings I have acquired on similar compulsive moments before. Or that my flatmate traveled this morning to Mexico for 10 days and I will be home alone with all the space, emotions and nightmares that could come with that. So I focused on the things that make sense and make me the good daughter I have been trying to be for the past few years but most urgently in the past few months. I stuck to the basics. I spent my Friday finishing all the piling tasks I have, replying to students, uploading reading materials, checking on relatives scattered all around the Gaza Strip, replying to those outside who reach out to me, asking about those inside. I told her that everyone around me sends her gre their greetings. Many are still reading her words and wait for them, and that I stayed up till 4 a.m. editing her latest dispatches about the situation back in the land of continuous genocide because we both know that when I am on a roll, I should stay on the roll or else it might take more days to get on it again. I know, Ya Habibti, we are very much alike. She assured me now as a close friend and told me that she received my messages with the edited dispatches the minute she got an internet signal May your hands stay healthy, she thanked me with my favorite way of thanking one another, while informing me that if I didn't notice yet, which is correct, indeed, I didn't, she already sent me two new dispatches, one from yesterday and one from today. On it, I answered as I answer usually, since she began writing these dispatches on the second week of the genocide, but I need to write my own thing today first. I have a reading tonight. I felt like I was hurrying up out of the fear that a drone will notice my mother as she talks to me and decide it is her turn today to be sniped or even bombed with all those staying with her. A daily dilemma between wanting to hear her voice and wanting her to stay still. A daily muta mutation of Emotions where I cannot be excited to hear her voice as I am equally terrified of it being the last time or of me hearing a scream instead of words. Khalas mama, please don't stay long on the roof. I already feel guilty you were there for two hours, I told her, feeling equally guilty about asking her to hang up. No, no, I need to be here. I am only alone here. And I know what she means. My mother has been living alone since I left her 21 years ago. She likes her routine, she likes her solitude, and she likes having the choice. And for almost four months now, she's been with tens of people, a lot of sounds and movements and conversations and imposed presence of others. She needs to be alone to write, to rant, to remind herself of the need to be patient, to remind herself to not take her nervousness on the little noisy kids, out on the little noisy kids who love their charismatic Khalto Zainab. I told your aunt Walla, your, child, your grandchildren are going to hate me by the end of the war. Yes, they love me, but I am not their grandmother. It is different if she screams at them. I am trying not to bother anymore, but I cannot hold back when I see some wrongdoings. I worry that she had a fight with them. She assures me that nothing took place. It is all happening inside of her. She needs to be alone to recharge and remember this is not going away soon, even with a ceasefire, because many people have no places, no more to go. But today also, the rain had stopped, the sun is out, the water tanks were thankfully refilled, and tell me, Mabruk, I took a shower. So yeah, while she tried to reach me and write her dispatches, she kept flipping the laundry on the lines, and she took off her, her towel, spread her hair under the sun, letting it breathe and warmly dry. Thank you.
Hi everyone, it's good to be with you all. Um, before I begin, I would like to say a few words about uh, an organization I'm a part of, Writers Against the War on Gaza. WAWAG, it's a terrible acronym, um, is a coalition committed to solidarity and the horizon of liberation for the Palestinian people, drawing together writers, editors, and other cultural workers, WAWAG hopes to provide ongoing infrastructure for cultural organizing in response to the war. We are engaged in fervent opposition to the genocidal nightmare of the apartheid state of Israel on multiple fronts. We reject the hollow neutrality and outright complicity of cultural and artistic institutions and seek to upend the status quo that allows the literary world to go on chasing its own tail while turning away from the genocide it has quietly co-sponsored for decades. If you are a culture worker and are interested in joining us, please come see me or my comrade Kyle Dekuyen uh, after the reading, Free Palestine. I'm going to read a piece by Mahmoud Darwish. It's called Silence for the Sake of Gaza. Gaza is not the most beautiful of cities. Her coast is not bluer than those of other Arab cities. Her oranges are not the best in the Mediterranean. Gaza is not the richest of cities. And Gaza is not the most polished of cities or the largest, but she is equivalent to the history of a nation because she is the most repulsive among us in the eyes of the enemy. The poorest, the most desperate, and the most ferocious. Because she is a nightmare. Because she is oranges that explode. Children without a childhood. Aged men without an old age and women without desire because she is all that. She is the most beautiful among us, the purest, the richest, and most worthy of love. We are unfair to her when we search for her poems. Let us not disfigure the beauty of Gaza. The most beautiful thing in her is that she is free of poetry at a time when the rest of us tried to gain victory with poems. We believed ourselves and rejoiced when we saw that the enemy had left us alone to sing our songs while we left victory for him. When we dried the poems from our lips, we saw that the enemy had already built entire cities, forts, and highways. It would be unfair to Gaza to turn her into a legend because we will end up hating her when we discover she is nothing more than a small, poor city that resists. And when we ask what has made her into a legend, we will have to break our mirrors and cry if we have any dignity or curse her if we refused to rebel against ourselves. It would be unfair to Gaza to glorify her because our fascination will make us wait for her. But Gaza will not come to us. Gaza will not liberate us. Gaza does not have horses or jet fighters or magic wands or offices in capitals. Gaza frees herself of all our attributes, our language, and of her conquerors all at once. And when we run into her, once upon a dream, 
She may not recognize us because she was born of fire while we were born of waiting and crying. True, Gaza has her special circumstances and her own revolutionary traditions. We say this not to dissect, but to disintegrate. The secret of Gaza is no mystery. Her masses are united in popular resistance. She knows what she wants to drive the enemy out of her hair. In Gaza, the relation between resistance and the masses is that of the flesh to the bone and not that of the teacher to the student. In Gaza, resistance has not become a salaried position. And in Gaza, resistance has not become an institution. She does not accept supervision from anyone. And she does not allow her destiny to hang on anyone's stamp or signature. It does not matter to her very much whether or not we know her name or recognize her image or rhetorical skills. She does not believe she is photogenic or a media event. She does not make ready for the camera with a smile plastered on her face. That is not what she wants and not what we want. Gaza's wound has not been changed into a platform for orators. What is beautiful about Gaza is that we do not discuss her much. And we do not perfume the smoke of her dreams with the feminine fragrance of our lyrics. Thus, Gaza would make a losing bet for the bookies. And for this very reason, Gaza is a moral and spiritual treasure of incalculable worth for all Arabs. What is beautiful about Gaza is that our voices do not reach her. Nothing diverts her attention. Nothing turns her fist away from the face of the enemy. Not the kind of Palestinian state that we will establish on the eastern side of the moon or the western side of Jupiter after it has been mapped or the distribution of seats in the National Council. Nothing diverts her attention. She is dedicated to rejection, hunger and rejection, thirst and rejection, dispersion and rejection, torture and rejection, siege and rejection, death and rejection. The enemy may defeat Gaza. The stormy sea might overwhelm a small island. They might cut down all her trees. They might break her bones. They might plant their tanks in the bellies of her women and children, or they might toss her into the sand, into the sea, into blood. But Gaza will not repeat the lies. Gaza will not say yes to the conquerors. And she will continue to erupt. It is not death. And it is not suicide. It is Gaza's way of announcing she is worthy of life. I'm Andrea Long Chu. I am uh, not a poet um, or an artist. I am a critic, and I'm going to say some things about criticism. So, last summer, 
the 92nd Street Y commissioned me to give a lecture on the state of criticism today that I decided to call on authority. I began to entertain the notion that I really did have something big and serious to say about criticism, where a critic's authority might come from, why authority was so essential for a critic. Of course, by a critic, I meant myself. And then a bulldozer tore through a fence across the sea. Since Israel launched its genocidal war on Gaza, a wave of Zionist suppression has swept over the American public sphere. This included the Y, which opted to torpedo the speaking series I was meant to be a part of rather than play host to writers, some of whom are in this room, whom it deemed insufficiently pro-war. So there I was trying to think about critical authority at a moment when questions of political and moral authority, the right of kings and the claims of the soul became impossible to ignore. For one thing a war forces the critic to do, hopefully, is to distinguish between actual political crises on the one hand and the self-aggrandizing existential crisis that criticism seems always to be going through on the other. For what in the past decade have we spent our time yodeling about in the Alps of culture? The idea that young people besotted with their own identity categories and invented grievances have a vice grip on the culture industry which they are blackmailing into producing bad movies. <laughs> that the left often cannot resist complaining about woke culture itself has increasingly struck me as a serious intellectual failure. It should rather, I think, be a question of learning how to parry reactionaries without resorting to reaction. Consider, I might have begun my talk on authority for the why by saying that critics today treat the work of art like a statement in the form of a work of art, that the critics of the past once provided a discipline which controlled the great republic of readers in a way which is now unknown to us, that the huge open mouth of periodical literature has engendered the practice of reviewing, a practice which in general has nothing in common with the art of criticism, that the modern critic's object is not to do justice to his author, whom he treats with very little ceremony, but to do himself homage, and indeed that criticism today amounts to little more than the arbitrary edicts of legislators authorized only by themselves. I have a medication that gives me dry mouth, sorry. <clears throat> Now, I say I could have said these things, provided I was content to repeat something Susan Sontag wrote in 1962, and Virginia Woolf in 1925, and Henry James in 1891, and William Hazlitt in 1822, and the good Dr. Samuel Johnson in 1750, for this is whom I have just quoted. How hard it turns out to be to make the case that this crisis in criticism has anything to do with our historical moment. It is sometimes claimed, for instance, that the internet has democratized criticism to a historically unprecedented degree. And this may feel true, but the umbrage taken by the scribbling classes at the explosion of opinions online reflects a much older grudge against literacy itself. Here is Samuel Taylor Coleridge, quote, all men being supposed able to read, and all readers able to judge, the multitudinous public sits nominal despot on the throne of criticism. He wrote this in 1817, but he might as well have been writing for the Atlantic last week. <laughs> now, it is true that of the criticism being published today, a little is excellent, a little more is adequate, and the lion's share is a dog's breakfast. But Bad criticism is bad, not because it has been despoiled by political ideology, but for all the usual reasons that writing is bad. It is poorly paid, hastily edited, and written mostly by freelancers with so little in the way of financial stability and access to health care that they may go their entire careers without finding out whether or not they are genuinely untalented. <laughs> there is no higher truth of criticism than what W.H. Auden once said of his book reviews, quote, I wrote them because I needed the money. <laughs> so there is your first answer. If you actually want better criticism, improve the material conditions of being a critic. But the serious critics are not after better criticism. They will say they are, but they do not really mean it. Their many attempts to restore authority to criticism are ultimately, I think, a campaign to reinstall the aesthetic realm as a kind of 
veiled protectorate, one that is nominally authorized to govern itself however it wishes, but in return promises not to challenge the political authority of our liberal institutions and so-called democratic norms. Criticism is thus, historically speaking, a kind of wall, one that will keep the king out and just as importantly, keep the populace in. But, walls fall. The sheer volume of abuse to which the lowly book reviewer has been subjected since the 18th century is proof enough that criticism has never actually succeeded at keeping the aesthetic cordoned off from the practical world. It must therefore constantly be on alert. Quote, when we encounter a writer who is primarily or solely the preacher, the politician, the sociologist, the psychologist, the philosopher, the rhetorician, the salesman, the patron, the blood relative, or the schoolmate, we must recognize him as such, wrote the critic Donald Stauffer in 1941. He fails to be a literary critic because his prime interest is not in literature as it exists. His heart is overseas. The final metaphor is telling. The bad critic, like a homesick soldier who lets the enemy slip past, has forgotten his duty not just to literature, but perhaps to his country as well. Of course, it is true that the health of the Republic does not turn on someone's interpretation of the latest great novel. What could be more ridiculous? But I am only suggesting that the manifest absurdity of such a thought is an ideological accomplishment, not a natural given. And for this, we have three centuries of criticism to thank. Thus, we find it only natural to rate a critic on the basis of her mental state, her poise, her catholicity, her scrupulousness, rather than the actual content of her judgments. We expect that the serious critic will leave her values at the door, but not her nose for valuing. We then applaud her for how many ideas she can root up without eating them. Hence the paradox of certain well-regarded critics today who write with great moral intensity, but little moral clarity. So, how should we do criticism in an actual crisis? We may start by rejecting the idea that formal principles of style or judgment are a substitute for political values. Whoever claims he has no horse in the great race of American political life is either lying or misinformed about himself. Either way, the public has a right to know which horse is his. As Auden put it, quote, if I find, for instance, that a critic believes in automatic progress, I shall no more trust him than I would trust a philosopher who liked Brahms. Now, does, this does not mean we must require the artist to always create political art, not least because such work can suffer from a kind of premastication. By the time it reaches us, it is mush. Let this be our slogan instead. Art for art's sake, but criticism for, this, for the sake of everything else. This seems more than fair to me. It reserves plenty of autonomy for the artist, probably more than she can be trusted with, but more importantly, it asserts that a critic answers neither to art nor to the state, but to the world that she and her readers both inhabit. And sometimes overseas is precisely where her heart belongs. Thanks. I'm Kyle Dukuyan, and I'm a poet, and as Chase said, I organize with Writers Against the War on Gaza. Come now, come with, go dark, cut deep, all goes, we will. I'll have to go out in the streets to get up to no good, no light, no end. Get up, fuck up, stop now. All work, stop flow, stop wealth, block ships, hold bridge, the way out now without withhold what we all have is what we stop we stand we stay we speak we strike we see what we all must give up give back the land we break the gate what it 
will take, will take the whole. The will to change the whole is part of what must now go in then more into the not, the earth, the core, the past of what is told is not the place or who proclaims the right. The pace of fight must now bring in the more of us, the more we see, the less the most of us will wait. We will not wait. The fate is what we make of all we touch, and all we touch will touch the free, the once, and soon the air will hold the kites, the sound of youth again, and age, and names of who will come, who were, what time we have is all, is now, is time, what all we have is now, the time is this, the time, the the time it is yes then yes now how y'all doing okay um osio latasha and nevada dix daguadoa i'm from harlem um, forgive me for any mistakes I make in my uh, interpretation of what's going down. Uh, this is a poem called WCNSF uh, for my friend and sister Hadil, for my student Huma, and for my other student, former student, Muhammad, I hope you're safe. And I hope your family is safe. Try to never mind mother's wailing, rivers blemished our seas, cradling souls toward paradise. See these necrotic bodies, post your celebrations beside the premature, post on vegan cane sugar as the air ignites and frost olives scorched made stray. Silences make gray even the complacent. It coats the voices with char. Little seems to amplify enough the gritty ash, dirt, graying hair, blood stirred in blood, the pain and numb crisis on these relics. All of this becomes pebbles, dust in tissue, pierced by wire. Fundraisers for more cutting edge curatorial projects are another social justice endeavor follows the dangling limbs off makeshift tables. We are on edge. Gray space of a blink, a blink tethered to thumbs north and south. It seems easy and eerie. Someone has lost 11 family members in tears, feel too little, too late. You halt from asking the ages you may or may not fear what the heart wants to holler aloud in the thick of smoke. The imagination shapes what the throat holds back, forces down with chunks of watermelon. A blood memory felt though never witnessed. This is not about numbers or historical markers, but how the bones feel the bodies splinter from past wars. Where are we now? A place in Haiti or Hawaii? The caves of Namibia, Okinawa, Vietnam are these mythical tunnels in Gaza. A good friend has just lost her job. Another is stricken by a stroke. 
another with a diagnosis of skin cancer. A colleague spins her honeymoon in hospice, another relapses. Your students are not sleeping. Minding can't be just business. Hadil has lost 11 family members. An elder's dementia is swift and strangely blessed. Confined to a nursing facility state run, you envy his reality to some degree. One would have to be not in their right mind to ignore dismembered ghosts beside their pillows these days. The infection stay spreading. Hi everyone, I'm Hafiza Jeter. Um, so before I start, I'll just say that I've been thinking a lot about Ann Boyer's resignation from the New York Times as a poetry editor. And one of the things she says is that sometimes all we have is our refusal. And I think that, you know, I try to think about that, like the ways we can refuse every day in small ways, whether we're refusing the people that support the war, or whether we're just refusing the narrative that is, you know, sweeping the country and or sweeping the world. And so this first poem is from my poetry book, but it's not a direct response to Gaza, but I think one of the things that it reminds me, that my parents always tried to remind me, is that what we have in common all over the world is our oppressors, and that that was their way of refusing the narrative. Un-American. My mother transfers the last marigold from a pot to a patch of earth that she's carefully bellied out beneath her. The dirt, cool as a penny, her fingers tender with the bright petals as she demonstrates how what's uprooted can return to solid ground. Her colonial English, helpless against her native tongue's prayers. Allahu Akbar, my mother says as casually as she says my name. The wind, warmer than the water from her morning wudu, continues its pilgrimage east a steady stream of fireworks chasing it in the distance. My mother looks at me all shine, her dreams quietly wild in her garden. She says the rain can do in Nigeria what no sun will ever do here in South Carolina. Her shadow my only relief from the Confederate heat. High noon, work done, my mother settles in on the front porch where my father swallows the landscape in his hands. Leaning over his shoulder, she watches him sketch another promise. His wife and last child digging in the garden. Our likenesses, figurines forever in a charcoal amber. In his mind, my father is always building shelter the spirits that haunt him like mice in the walls, oranges for Christmas, a single pair of khakis to last all year, his mother on her knees, Murphy oiling a white woman's Alabama home. The heat licks the corners of my father's sketchbook to a curl. He draws God's shadow right down to the horns. In the garden, the bees burn their tongues on sprouting chili peppers, turning the honey mad. Fireworks splash against my parents' American dream, a switch that turns all their ghosts on. Children prowl the streets with sparklers in hand, impatient for the holiday to dusk. I look for the ones like me and my sister who, not born in this country, can never be president. My sister upstairs, asleep in the relief of this independence. Returned from college, she still never shed the gate of our barely remembered home country. My longing could drive a car. Citizen I am to our parents' wounds. My sisters and my blood, the scar healed between them. Half of us never owned, half southern lynched strange fruit. How un-American to wear the names of what they fled. 
My grass-stained knees pledge allegiance to a country that belongs to no one I love. And these next two poems, I'm going to read about Palestinian poets. I Am the Stranger by Bassem Jamil, translated by Nicole Menkinen. I am the stranger, the shadow beneath the cloud, adrift and looming over my land. Only the cloud beckons. It has its purpose for me. I succumb to its atmosphere, levitate and fall in billowing drifts. I am pulled in all directions, but my desire, O oh cloud, is higher. Let it rise to the peak of Rama to overlook my postponed destiny. Send the wind that pushes me. I'm spent yet full of readiness and smiling through my breathless, my breathless facade into thunder and storm. I become the rain. The roots of my land absorb me. Renewed, I start again. For the Dead Among Us by Lisa Suher Majaj. We will open the day for you and the night. We know that you are beneath the earth or ash on the wind, but in some space or time, you still live, even as funeral bells clang and the priest swings the incense, the heart remembers how to open. We will invite you to the table to eat. We will light candles on our mantelpieces and in our hearts. We do not know what messages of light and smoke will reach you but we will keep sending them. We will keep you alive in our longing, in our breath. We will sing with you together in a space of music, even if you never sang in life. Love finds a way. It is not linear with a destination, a closure. Love starts over and over, circling back to the source, the way two people lose and find each other repeatedly. But when they look into each other's eyes, they see each other, the light of recognition that makes the world whole. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone. We're going to take a 15-minute break. We will be back with Kaleem. Um, don't forget to donate. Um, if you are online and are having trouble seeing the link, it is secure.actblue slash donate slash 2024 writers for the number four pal. There it is. Um, if you're here physically, there is a QR code in the corner. You can also, um, and right over there, take, uh, enjoy the break, get to the restroom. We've got coffee in the back. See you in a bit.
and they see gay. Hello, everybody. If you could find your way back to your seats. Welcome back. Another reminder, it's my job tonight. Please donate to Palestine Legal. And if you have, if you feel moved, feels meaningful to you, if you have a couple extra dollars, do you please consider donating to Mecca as well, um, uh, to organizations that are fighting for the lives, liberty, freedom, <clears throat> and future of Palestinians um, in two different ways. So keeping those in your mind, Kaleem, when you're ready. Hi everyone, my name is Kaleem. Um, I'm a Palestinian writer and organizer. I'm gonna read um, some poems about Gaza. The first poem is called The Composition of the Fourth Twelve and it's written after uh, Andre Monasterski. Six X squared plus five X plus two equals zero. Millions of people broken down into a quadratic formula. He says to me, two halves of a rowboat, rowboats, double chin throats, human, human, backbones, faces, faces, floorboards, shoulders, shoulders. Solve it and you solve the conflict. Get it wrong and you die. It's like if the 20 impossibles of the Moscow conceptualists were elementary poetry. Sea divided by field. Far better to forget the sum total of life's miseries than to sit quietly with them. Second poem is called Jericho II. It's trauma theory for the televised era. Feasting on the sight of women cowering in their rebelled homes and the serious men with their weapons of war and their cartographies of feeling. But occupation is more convalescence, an indigo bloom that works slowly seeping into a water that fills the basin, hydroponic for the crops, that washes the faces, barbasol on a skin now cleaned of its inconvenience. And if acclimation is just another experience of death, then it is also cyanotrophic, metabolizing our unease, casting us about in search of our riverbed bodies, the serious men, noting the stomach bloated, the neck a dark bruise blue, confirming those solemn vows to bury the houses amongst the ferns of the Jordan River. This third poem is called uh, uh, Haifatu, mm -hmm. and it's written after uh, Khaled de Jarrar. In Haifa, a storm front. A front-facing eye of the storm, a popular front for the storms needing liberation from their skies. In that storefront, a Haifa. A Haifa where she got a phone call. Hello, Haifa's mothers are on the line. They wish to speak with you. Hope you're well. Hope you're sitting for this. There was a time when a burial was an invitation to congregate to bear arms, coffin bear, bear palls for the Palestinians to allow themselves to look at paper pictures and inscriptions and flowers and then to pick up a brick and throw it at a helmeted skull, missing the target and chasing after the soldier to smash their face in and beating their eye sockets until they're mush. The call came with a letter and the brick and a chisel and a green flag. In my father's memories of Haifa, and in my mother's father's memories of Haifa, 
there are clouds. Suha and Rula and Yafa and Clara, they spoke it through the bars of the cell and it tangled around the garden. Wound through the street and hitched a ride on the taxi cab driven by the two Druze soldiers smoking and petting each other in the dark. Us in the back seat, they spoke it to us, I swear. This doesn't happen, except in Palestine. But it does. Storms everywhere, there are mothers and prisons too. Okay, and this last poem is called Transviridescence, um, and it is written after Amiri Baraka. Okay, we made the signs, corrected a few spelling mistakes. The meek ones stood in the corner, waging war internally, but the crazy and the beautiful, those that kissed antagonism on the lips, handed out a flyer and asked, are you interested in being me? That morning, I ordered blackberry pancakes, washed it down with hot coffee in a white mug, then got some bad news, and then some more. Thank you. to listen. <clears throat> no one gives a damn about a poem until they need a poem. The poet is a poem. My mother is a poem. Women are poems. Palestinian women are poems. Palestinian people are poems who need poems. Black labor is a poem another person will say they wrote. <laughs> Black babies are weeds. No one thinks a fat person is a poem, at most an anthem. Disability poems can be read when an abled person says so. The urge toward poetry is a type of soil. A Palestinian death is a poem we clamor to sing. What I said before about black people is half a poem. Black intellect is a diving board, a wellspring, a tornado, a patient lava. Black poems show you everything about the world you claim to love. Love is a muscle the poem exercises, or not. A weed in the mouth of a poem is a fruit. My name is Omatara James. and I'm a writer. What Havisa said before about our oppressions around the world being connected is very true and very overwhelming, but also, if it is true, our revolutions are also connected. Poem to watch over you. The day you were born was the shortest of the year, or the longest. There was a rainstorm, or hail, or it was a cloudy or cloudless night. And your mother, or your birth mother, or your father, or your birth father, or your life giver, was reading at home, was on their way back from the store, was on their way to work, had no place to go, was dreaming of you when you woke them, when it was time, when you were ready to arrive, to escape, to see what the fuss was about on their way to the hospital, or on their way home, on the way to the midwife or the bathtub, 
in the back of the ambulance, taxi, or parking lot, on the side of a hill. We received you, pulled you through, held you, made an opening and whispered, shouted, urged, pleaded, you are welcome, you are welcome, you are welcome. There is no requirement or identification, no documentation. You were born without restriction. Not even the supernatural world could hold you back, bold thing, from this oblivion. Okay, why not? Found God poem. There is no God but God. Thank God. God of that's what you get. God who don't like ugly. Lord above. Lord have mercy. Mercy me. As God is my witness. I have loved my neighbor, have broken bread, and yet God, whose eye is on the sparrow, whose eye I fear, for the love of God, omnipotent Lord and Savior, hear my prayers. Lord, help us, God forsaken. God, who is the greatest. God, who saves queens. Will it? God only knows where I'd be without you. What did I do to deserve this? God of my understanding, who works in mysterious ways. Show yourself. It's showtime. All glory unto God. God in heaven, in which we trust, O oh God. Oh, God, forgive me, my God. Please, 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 please. God of my promises and frailties. God who helps those who help themselves. Who sits silent in the room where it happens. God damn. Which God did I offend? Show me the act of God. So help me God. Thank you. My name is Leslie Jameson, and uh, I just want to start by saying that it's such an honor to be in this room of um, grief and beauty and truth. Um, I'm going to read a few words, um, part of an essay called Who Will Pay for the 20 Years Lost? And uh, this essay was written by a young Palestinian writer and student named Youssef Dawas, who was uh, killed in an airstrike in his family's home on October 14th. Near the end of the essay, his father tells him about the destruction of their farmlands in an airstrike. Our trees in the fields have been turned to ash. His words were heavy and they fell from his mouth. An awkward silence gripped the house before he added, I planted those trees. I nurtured them and watered them with my own hands. Week by week, month by month, year by year. I saw those leaves and branches grow. 
He took a heavy breath and continued in a lower tone while trying to hold back his tears. These trees were older than you, Yusef. I didn't want to go and see the damaged farmland. I really wasn't curious to see my memories burned into ashes. The last time I was there, I had sat beneath olive trees with my friends eating za'atar, bread, and olive oil. We drank tea, roasted corn, and picked fruit. I can still taste those flavors and smell the air. But now, three rocket holes plagued these memories. They had left dark gray sand and the scorched remains of trunks and branches from trees that used to bear the fruit of olives, oranges, clementines, loquat, guavas, lemons, and pomegranates. I put my hands on my heart to catch it from falling, and I felt the three holes there in my heart. This latest attack on Gaza had successfully destroyed an important piece of our past, our family's history, our heritage. But who are we without a past or history, I asked myself. I tried to reassure my father by saying the land would recover and we could work with the support of the United Nations to replant the trees that we lost. Even if somebody helps us repair the damage and plants new trees, who will give me those years back that I spent nurturing them and supporting them to grow? He snapped back at me. Who will pay for the 20 years we have lost? Um, and I'd like to read in closing two um, pieces of writing by Mahmoud Darwish. Um, the first is his poem, The Stranger Stumbles Upon Himself in the Stranger. And then I just want to read a short piece of prose um, from the interviews collected in the book Palestine as Metaphor. The Stranger Stumbles Upon Himself in the Stranger. We are one in two. There's no name for us, woman when the stranger stumbles upon himself in the stranger. Of our garden, behind us, we have the force of shadow. So show what you want of your night's land and conceal what you want. We came in a hurry from the twilight of two places at one time and searched together for our addresses. Go behind your shadow, east of the song of songs, a shepherd of sand grouse. You'll find a star dwelling in its death. Then climb a neglected mountain, and you'll find my yesterday completing its cycle in my tomorrow. You'll find where we were and where we'll be together. We are one in two. Go to the sea then, man, west of your book and dive lightly, lightly, as if you were carrying yourself at birth in two waves. You'll find a wetland forest and a green sky of water. Then dive lightly, lightly, as if you were nothing in anything, and you'll find us together. We are one in two. We need to see how we were here, stranger, as two shadows opening and closing on what has been shaped of our shape. A body disappearing, then reappearing in a body disappearing in the mystery of the eternal duality. We need to return to being two to embrace each other more. There's no name for us when the stranger stumbles upon himself in the stranger. The force of despair lies in the fact that it gives you the feeling of a capacity to compose a new human presence. Its creative strength is in opposition to the destructive capacity of the victor. 
Despair can begin creation anew because it is capable of finding the necessary splinters, those of the first things, of the first elements of creation. And this force, this impetuosity, reverses the roles. And in the despairing, one finds himself again in a position of strength. Why is it that we never tire of poetry? What is the origin of the immunity of poetry? I like poetry because it gives us the gift of strength, although fictitious. Why doesn't the jailer sing? The captive sings because he is alone with himself, while the jailer exists only in terms of the other whom he is guarding. He is vigilant over the isolation of the captive to the point that he forgets his own solitude. Hello everyone, my name is Jesenia Montilla. I'm a poet. Um, I'm a poet who has been censored, has been disinvited, has been uh, fired for my stance with Palestine. And so I'm here to implore all of you to give to Palestine Legal. They are doing the work of the good gods and they deserve our support. Um, I'm going to read two poems, the first one by June Jordan. And what I want to say about the poem is that, I wrote it down just so I wouldn't forget. Um, this poem might seem demoralizing, but for me it's a gift. It has taught me that politicians and governments have always done the bare minimum, if anything at all. This poem allows me to move towards something that might actually save all of our lives, give us meaning and purpose. That is, to focus and foster community care there is no equity in these United States. There's only what we can foster among ourselves, how we meet our own needs, and work towards collective liberation. Uh, this poem reminds me that we are not special. Men before us have picked up this plight for Palestinian sovereignty. This poem is about the Palestinian people, their resolve to continue existing against all odds. No, this poem does not demoralize me, it gives me wings, and I hope it does the same for all of you. This is Apologies to All the People in Lebanon by June Jordan, dedicated to the 600,000 Palestinian men, women, and children who lived in Lebanon from 1948 to 1983. I didn't know, and nobody told me, and what could I do or say anyway they said, you shot the London ambassador, and when that wasn't true, they said, so what? They said, you shelled their northern villages, and when UN forces reported that that was not true because your side of the ceasefire was holding since more than a year before, they said, so what? They said they wanted simply to carve a 25-mile buffer zone, and then they ravaged your water supplies, your electricity, your hospitals, your schools, your highways and byways, all the way north to Beirut because they said this was a quest for peace. They blew up your homes and demolished the grocery stores and blocked the Red Cross and took away doctors to jail. And they cluster bombed girls and boys whose bodies swelled purple and black into twice the original size and tore the buttocks from a four month old baby and then they said, this was brilliant, military, accomplishment. And this was done, they said, in the name of self-defense. They said that this is the noblest concept of mankind. Isn't that obvious? They said something about never again, and then they made close to one million human beings homeless in less than three weeks. And they killed or maimed 40,000 of your men and your women and your children. But I didn't know and nobody told me, and what could I do or say anyway? 
They said they were victims. They said you were Arabs. They called your apartments and gardens guerrilla strongholds. They called the screaming devastation that they created the rubble. Then they told you to leave, didn't they? Didn't you read the leaflets that they dropped from their hotshot fire jets? They told you to go. 135,000 Palestinians in Beirut, and why didn't you take the hint? Go. There was the Mediterranean. You could walk into the water and stay there. What was the problem? I didn't know, and nobody told me, and what could I do or say? Anyway, yes. I did know it was the money I earned as a poet that paid for the bombs and the planes and the tanks that they used to massacre my family, to massacre your family. But I'm not an evil person. The people of my country aren't so bad. You can expect but so much from those of us who have to pay taxes and watch American TV. You see my point? I'm sorry. I really am sorry. And I'll close it with a poem of my own. Maps. Some maps have blue borders like the blue of your name or the tributary lacing of veins running through your father's hands and how the last time I saw you, you held me for so long, I saw whole lifetimes flooding by me, small tentacles reaching for both our faces. I wish maps would be without borders and that we belong to no one and to everyone at once. What a world that would be. Or not a world, maybe we would call it something more intrinsic, like forgiving, or something simplistic, like river or dirt. And if I were to see you tomorrow, and everyone you came from had disappeared, I would weep with you and drown out any black lines that this earth allowed us to give it. Because what is a map but a useless prison we are all so lost and no naming of blank spaces can save us. And what is a map but the delusion of safety? The line drawn is always in the sand and folds on itself before we're done making it. And that line there, south of El Rio, how it dares to cover up the bodies as though we, were, we would forget who died there and for what, as if we could forget that if you spin a globe and stop it with your finger, you'll land it on top of someone living, someone who was not expecting to be crushed by thirst. Hi. Um, I'm Miller Oberman, um, <clears throat> and I think I have never been more honored to read with a group of people than with you all here tonight, um, and with you all who are here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, <clears throat> I turned in a manuscript to my editor on October 1st for my second book of poems, um, which largely deals with the loss of my brother um, who died when he was two and the way that that kind of trauma and grief can move through generations of a family, um, in this case, an anti-Zionist Jewish family. Um, and of course, now uh, my entire book feels different to me, um, confronted as I am and as all of you are um, with the deaths of thousands and thousands of children. Um, and what seemed to me then to be poems about grief, I now see largely um, I look at them now and I see the amazing luxury in getting to spend time um, mourning our dead. Um, and I am absolutely in awe of the Palestinian poets and writers and journalists who are writing and reaching out every single day right now, um, processing individual and mass death. Um, they are my absolute heroes. Um, so. I'm going to read three poems. Um, the first is in this amazing book, Enemy of the Sun, um, from 1970, which I highly recommend, um, from Drummond's Beer Press, though I doubt you can get it for $2.50 now, as it says on the cover. Um, and it's by Salem Jubran. Um, 
This poem is called A Hanging Human, 1964. One of the toys that appeared on the Israeli market was that of a hanged Arab. A hanging human body, the prettiest of toys, the sweetest recreation for children displayed on the market. No, it is not there anymore. It has been sold out for days. Don't search for it. Tell your child it's sold out for days. Oh, souls of those dead in Nazi concentration camps, the hanged human is not a Jew in Berlin. The hanged human is an Arab, like me of my people, hanged by your brothers. Forgive me, hanged by the crypto-Nazis in Zion. Souls of the victims of Nazi camps, if only you knew. If only you knew. <laughs> um, this poem, this is a chazal called The Wind is Loud. Um, the wind is loud on the water today. <clears throat> I think about him drowning. I walk to the store for a bottle of wine. I think about him drowning. I read to Rosie before her nap in the rocker where he's drowning. I make her a peanut butter sandwich cut in triangles. Think about him drowning. I rinse her little blue plate and spoon in cool water where he's drowning. I get up to pee in the night with the light off and he's drowning. An old woman throws crusts to gulls. In their descent, I see him drowning. Wondering if there's a word for how birds all move together, drowning. Thinking about my father, thinking about him, drowning. I think about him, drowning. This is called The Cake. The last time I saw my father, when we both were breathing, it was almost my birthday. The air alive with lilacs, for Scythia's rioting in the lane. A little wind lifts the lace curtains. My mother hangs invariably in every window. He doesn't like my birthday cake, which is chocolate, and asks for cake like that, pointing to a painting his friend made gold white sphere surrounded by deepest blue, which before then we called his go into the light painting and now call the cake painting. <laughs> I think he's looking at me, but he's looking past where he says they gather. Do you see them? No, I say, tell me. You don't see them, my father, the others? I saw only him seeing them. The cake still tasted good to me. I thought I knew the difference between things you could and couldn't touch. A window frame, a wooden chair, his soft sleeping shirt, the air. Papa, I say. Papa, he says. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Camille Rankin. I'm a poet. Um, I'm going to start off by reading a couple of poems by other poets, um, Palestinian poets. This is the one by Noor Hindi, Breaking News. We'll wake up Sunday morning and read the paper, read each other, before consumers of each other's stories a desperate reaching for another body's warmth, its words buoying us through a world we carry, graveyards on our backs. And I'm holding a lightning bug, hostage in one hand, its light dimming in the warmth of my fist, and in the other, a pen to document its death. Isn't that terrible? I'll ask you, shutting my fence once more. In interviews, I frame my subject stories through a lens to make them digestible to consumers. I become a machine, a transfer of information, the stories a plea for empathy, an oversaturation of feelings we'll fail at transforming into action. 
What's lost is incalculable. And at the end of summer, the swimming pools will be gutted of water and it will be impossible to swim. And this is one um, by Mahmoud Darwish, Earth Poem. A dull evening in a rundown village, eyes half asleep. I recall 30 years and five wars. I swear the future keeps my ear of corn and the singer croons about a fire and some strangers and the evening is just another evening and the singer croons and they ask him, why do you sing? And he answered, I sing because I sing. And they searched his chest, but could only find his heart. And they searched his heart, but could only find his people. And they searched his voice, but could only find his grief. And they searched his grief, but could only find his prison. And they searched his prison, but could only see themselves in chains. I want to say thank you so much to the organizers of this event and for everyone for being here. Um, it's such a disorienting and deeply disquieting experience to look at what's happening in Palestine and Gaza and the West Bank and see it for what it is, um, the effort to destroy Palestinian people and then be told by your country that that's not what you're seeing and that to speak that truth is somehow an act of hate. Um, and I'm just really grateful for organizations like Palestinian Legal for giving, giving people a sense that there's someone else who will be there um, to support them if they speak that truth and face the consequences for it. Um, so thank you, and if you haven't donated, please do. Um, I'm gonna read one more poem. This is one that I've written. In truth, I thought there was a truth we could agree on. What is loss? What is calamity? I bowed my head before a storm of our own making. When I looked up, I had folded all the world into these words. It was night in a dense forest. My country turned its back to me. I opened up to scream. The storm's wind rushed in, and in the dark, I coughed up someone else's grief. In truth, I thought, what if I made myself so small I never hurt again? Not me or someone else. A point so dense and hot with light, enough to animate this armor. Is this how stars are made or how they are destroyed? In truth, I had hope. It softened me for slaughter. Softened me so bad, I can't find the end of me for where my enemy begins. Am I lost or just calamity? I set my back against the wind. In the dark, a single star. I see the forest for the forest for the trees. Thank you. Hi everyone, hi. My name is Elisa de Velasquez and this is my son and I will let him introduce himself and the poems that he will be reading. Do you want me to take this down? I can reach the mic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, my name is Adrian Olivo and I will be reading Two poems from this book, Things You May Find in My Ear, by Palestinian Mossab Ab Abu Toha. All right, let me just get this. My city streets are nameless. If a Palestinian gets killed by a sniper or a drone, we name the street after them. Children learn the numbers best when they can count on how many homes or schools were destroyed, how many mothers or fathers were wounded or thrown into jail. 
Grown-ups in Palestine only use their IDs so as not to forget who they are. Um, I, uh, um, my second poem is called Hard Exercise. Um, <clears throat> in Gaza, breathing is a task. Smiling is performing plastic surgery on one's own face. And rising in the morning, trying to survive, another day is coming back from the dead. Thank you. Our children will remember what we said. Our children will remember what we did not say. Our children will have memory or no memory of how fearless we were, of how fearful we were to say something, to say anything about our children who are made ancestors, who are made orphans, who are made journalists, who are made poets, our children, to whom we give only the best parts of our country, its greenest parks, its grandest attractions, to whom we say in whatever language has not yet been drowned from our tongues, in whatever homes have not yet been occupied, everything will be okay. Even when we are not sure we believe it, our children who grow up one day will finally know that we have been lying or telling the truth about the world, the bombs, the wars, the laws, and the lawmakers that displace, starve, and kill our children who will become adults one day will ask and where were you? And who were you? And what did you do? Thank you. Débiles. Oh, suaves ofendidos, que os elevais, crecéis y llenáis de poderosos débiles del mundo. César Vallejo. Wrote these words in 1939 about the people who defended Guernica or weak ones, oh, softly offended ones. You rise, you grow, and you fill the world with powerful, weak. Words are scared of us as we are scared of them. Did we fight the 
Second World War so that we could become them banning books censoring speech exterminating those we don't like the word censor began in Rome as the Latin sensere to appraise, to value, to judge. And it came from an old root that says cans, which in some languages became as a song of praise. It was only in the 16th century that it became a different meaning to reach, to name rigid moralist censure. And then a century later it became the name for an official empowered to examine anything heretical. It is only in the early 19th century that it became a state agent charged with suppression of speech. Think of the evolution oh, in reverse. The evolution we are, we are pushing the world to censor, censor our thoughts. I dreamt we were losing our language because we're losing our humanness. Each sound is afraid of the next. Each letter mistrusts, mistrusts its neighbors. Sand, sir, ship, earth, ship, earth. Our indifference to their death. Four boats. Our death. Ex der mination is taking place. They king is king. Ga. Za ataka ma kung ko ama zon the heart of hurt the heart of earth is hurt. Long ago, when I was Chilean and we were struck by the practice of disappearing people, the practice that is now spreading around the world, I wrote this poem. En español, los desaparecidos par han sido. In Spanish, when you open up the word this appear, it means this, like disassembling, like separating a pair, a pair, like the two that is one. In that wish poem, I thought hearing your poems. Rosal Kala translated this saying 
the saying goes, evil was invented to give us something to talk about. But how to speak if each syllable falls into the sea? The M of mother drifting away. Other, other, where have you gone? The F of father sinking further down. Other, other, where have you gone? They didn't fall, they were thrown to leave us without speech, to leave us without speech. Thinking of the cruelty of refusing help to refugees. If our songs could become clean water, if our songs could become clean food, if our songs could heal the wounds, If our songs could heal the soul, if our songs to thank this place, to thank legal Palestine. I recall for you the heart, the core of the word gracias in Spanish. Gracias related to the Tala Latin grace, gracia. But gracias is also a common root with grada, meaning a step to climb to another state of being, of consciousness, of togetherness. These are the last lines for you. Our thoughts go to decision makers, those who think up these policies. Let the thoughts that instill cruelty and the thoughts that instill kindness do battle in the sky. The sphere where all our thoughts meet to become each other. Gracias, amigos. And please donate, that's the word of the day. <laughs>
thank you so much for coming. And before you go, I would invite you to give a big hand to the writers, to Palestine Legal, and to the People's Forum. Thank you very much. That's all for tonight.